Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to the future intersections of food, tech, and culture. I can't be more thrilled to be on stage with the three of you. I feel like we've come from four different corners of the universe, and somehow we landed here today, accidentally, maybe not so accidentally. Uh, we're gonna talk about what it means to build a future food system that's better for everyone. At some point, there's gonna be 10 billion people on Earth, and we all are trying to get to that better future together. So uh, I would be terrible at introducing these folks because they are so incredible, and I'm so humbled to be here. So we're gonna start with intros from each of you through the question of what is the unique lens you bring to the challenge of building a future food system for everyone? Steven, you first. Okay, I can start. I'm Steven Satterfield. I am the founder of Whetstone Media. Whetstone is a magazine and a media company all about food origins, culture, and culinary anthropology. And so we really look at food origins as a means of reclamation and understanding more about ourselves and just the experience of being a human being on Earth. Lovely. Andrew? Hey everyone, I'm Andrew Zimmern. Um, I, uh, I make a lot of television. I own a production company. It's not funny. Uh, no, it's very funny. Uh, I own a production company called Intuitive Content and a uh, restaurant development company called Passport Hospitality and uh, a little marketing group that services both of those. Um, and I, I just have I've stuck around for a long time, and I'm very passionate about issues that we seem to be ignoring. So for the last 20 years, I've sort of tilted into a world of what I just call service, being of service to other people. And wherever that takes me, I go. And where it's taken me for the last 12 years is into the future of food and how to create a more, how to fix a broken food system that I believe is is the key to our survival. Here, here, Denise. Hi, everyone. I'm Denise Osterhughes, and I kind of have two hats. Uh, one, I lead our uh, the Kroger Environmental, Social, and Governance uh, portfolio and strategy for Kroger, uh, and so I'm based in Cincinnati. And then I also serve as president of the Kroger Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation, which is a public charity really focused on our mission of helping create communities free of hunger and waste. And as a large grocery retailer with about 2,800 supermarkets that, that many of you may know well, uh, we realize our customers tell us all the time that they want choice and they want a wide range of food options. And as we contemplate a growing global population, um, we are thinking about how we're going to be able to use the food we produce today to feed everyone and then do the same years and decades from now for future generations um, to make sure that we are growing food sustainably and that we have a more inclusive and equitable food system. Thank you, Denise. Well, my name is Emily. I head up a team at Google called Food for Good. You might be wondering why the heck is a tech company sitting on a stage to talk about food? We're really good at moving zeros and ones around, uh, maybe less so at moving food related things around, but we do have cafes in 170 offices in 55 countries. So we learned a lot about uh, my team, I learned a lot by cooking in our kitchens and figuring out what data and tech could do to help with our food system. Uh, I am thrilled to have our friends here today. Uh, my passion areas are really in food waste and food insecurity and Denise has taught me so much about those topics along the way. So with that, now that you have a little bit of an intro to us, we're gonna go through the meat of this session with three questions. So the first one is, you know, why is it so hard to get to a future food system that we all seek? We all believe in a future food system that is less broken, that is more equitable, that is more sustainable. Why is it so hard to get there? The second question is going to be around how we approach it. So we're coming from four different corners, uh, four different ways of approaching this question. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we're gonna finish off with what is one thing out of the million things we're doing that we wanna share with you today? So uh, let's start with the first one. Stephen, given where you sit and all the things that you've seen, we all believe in this future food system. Why is it so hard to get there? 
Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what informs my work and uh, point of view is really taking a historical perspective. Um, there are challenges that we face today and tomorrow, um, some of which have occurred before any of us were here. Um, and I think as a culture, as a society, we do a really bad job of actually um, looking backwards with a context of uh, how to inform the challenges that we face today. And so as it relates to the food system, um, when we're talking about an aspiration of building one that is more equitable, more inclusive, less environmentally devastating, um, we ought to ask ourselves, was the food system constructed with those intended outcomes? The answer is no. And so um, trying to build a future food system that doesn't account for um, the ways in which it was built uh, is an incomplete view, I think. Yeah, I think it evolved in ways um historically that are really important that we need to acknowledge. You know, Andrew, I remember us talking about this a little bit and you talked about how it's a Mobius strip and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Oh dear, do you want my microphone? Sure, this one died. Sharing's caring. Hello. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, something Stephen said though, I, I, I wanted to, to just underscore a little bit um, because I think it's how we get to this Mobius strip idea of mine. Um, f food systems 10,000 years ago when the first human beings were migrating and trading uh, grains, wines, cheeses, uh, goats, uh, whatever it may be, uh, sometimes just a basket of fruit, um, the, uh, the transactions were not financial. They were emotional. You gave someone some some food, you were provided safety for a small bit of time. There's an incredible tradition in the Levant, that, that whole area that we mostly call the Middle East, that if a stranger arrived in your tent, they received, you couldn't ask them a question for three days. You fed and, and provided shelter uh, for them, and if they left, so be it. If they stayed more than three days, you got to ask them questions. They made coffee by ringing bells that you could hear for 10, 15 miles down these canyons in the Valley of the Moon in Jordan. Um, there was no money exchanged. It was an emotional transaction, one built around safety and camaraderie because it was a lonely, scary world. People died early. Many people did not have much. A thousand forms of selfishness have destroyed that system. You said something, Emily, at the beginning. You said, uh, we all believe in a more equitable food system and trying to figure out this future. I, I believe we all do. I believe you all do because you wouldn't be here if you didn't. I don't think anybody in the US government raises their hand and says, I believe in keeping children hungry. Yet, the fact of the matter is, is that we behave in a way that is as if people are raising their hand and saying, we believe in keeping children hungry because we have the ability to solve that problem. We can, we can statistically eliminate hunger in this country. We just choose not to do it. And I think that there are choices that we make. Thank you. I think there are choices that we make that over the last hundred years have been, you know, at first embarrassing and, and then embarrassing and shameful and then criminal and now almost genocidal coming out of COVID where we know that we have mistreated huge populations of disparate groups of people much differently than others and it is an unfair and rigged system. The Mobius strip idea that I have is really what links things like food technology and culture. If you imagine a Mobius strip, which is a never-ending, one-sided, twisted, geometric piece. Uh, I hopped in uh, in food, 
right? But there's a hundred different points on that strip. And, you know, there's culture and there's tech and there's hunger and there's waste and there is economic security and international diplomacy and yes, immigration and climate. And if you jump in at any one of those under, other ones that I mentioned, eventually you're going to bump in to things like hunger and waste and culture and tech. It's impossible. So the, the point that it illustrates for me is number one, we have to be somewhat conversant in these other things regardless of what our specialty is, but more importantly, we really have to accept the fact that it's not a one solution to our problem uh, thing. It is a, we have to hit 20 different levers at the same time, and beneath those are sub-levers, but we really have to drive 20 or 30 different things if we are going to survive as a planet by 2050 because we are, we're, we're not headed in the right direction fast enough. So it's amazing, the Mobius strip blew my mind because I was talking to Denise about zero hunger, zero waste and how zero hunger and zero waste are two sides of the same coin. You add another dimension with your Mobius strip. Well, I, it, it's just fascinating <laughs> to me, you know, if you, if you enter in, you know, if, if you want to talk about solving, if you want to talk about feeding Americans, let's, I mean, I'm, I'm more conversant with here than I am necessarily in other places because I live here and I, I, I spend most of my time in America. If you want to feed all Americans, you have to fix our immigration problem. You have to, you can't do it without that, right? We have problems with our immigration problem. We have problems with social justice and social equity. You have to fix these problems, start to address them, and then you will see change in, in, in feeding all Americans, right? You gotta change the financial structure. We just, we, we have a hesitancy, we don't want to. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who want to ride out the status quo. I think it's an element of selfishness, some call it greed, some call it financial imperative. There's lots of big reasons for it, but there are actually people who sit there and say, well, of course I believe all children and all Americans, you know, and old, young, black, white, yellow, everyone should be fed, everyone, you know, but then don't act according to those beliefs. And I just think that is, that disingenuousness, disingenuousness, that hypocrisy is what we need to address in so many different ways. Well said, well said. Well, Denise, I mean, you have touch points with 65 million households in the United States, and Kroger stepped up so much. So where are you at? Why is this hard? So I think it is, it's hard because it's so incredibly complex, and it is a food system with a lot of smaller ecosystems within it. And so, you know, as Kroger, we buy, move, and sell um, a lot of food. And so, as you can imagine, and we have a global supply chain. So our ESG strategy, uh, which we shared last year in our ESG report, if anyone's interested, uh, really focuses on the work that aligns to help people, planet, and systems. And, and it's really encompassing like 32 different topics. Each one of them <laughs> is complex within itself. But our zero hunger, zero waste plan is built on the absurdity in our food system um, that we produce more than enough food today to feed everyone, but yet people are going hungry. And we truly believe that we won't end hunger until we all stop throwing so much food away. And so we look at that in our own operations as Kroger in terms of the food waste we generate in our retail operations, for example. And we've been on a path working with partners. I told Emily this morning, I'm like, I think Google knows more about our food waste at Kroger than I do. Absolutely confident in that. I would also put World Wildlife Fund in that category because they do our food waste footprint. But it's been really, I do believe, these are really hard and complex topics to navigate, but we have great partners, we have thought leaders who are passionate about the space, and so we're not doing it alone. Um, and I do think data and insights, you know, we know a lot about our customers, the, the 60 million plus households who shop with us, we know what they say they want to do, and then we know what they do <laughs> when they shop with us. So it's been a really, you know, it's another layer of insight. And our customers tell us they want to eat healthier. They want more sustainable options. They want to support all of the things. It is hard for them on shelf to kind of sift through the certifications and the logos 
and all of the details. You know, we're still trying to understand nutrition labels in some way. So adding the sustainability labels is another level of awareness and education that we're still needing to build. You know, this is such a complex, beautiful set of systems. And when I look at the food world and the way I got into it was, it was the one thing that holds us all together. All 7.7 .7 billion of us eat every day, right? I was working in other spaces before I came to the food world and I was touched by how much history there is, how much culture there is, how much ritual there is. And you know, to Andrew's point, it's very spiritual and emotional and yet to sustain 7.7 .7 billion people on earth, we need folks like Denise and Kroger to be moving the food through the system at scale. And so, you know, what's been hard for me is just honoring the fact that, you know, it is the world's largest industry. It is the world's oldest industry and system. And there's a lot of existing ways of working, a lot of existing um, mindsets and, and, and history behind that. And so, um, and, and it's been hard to share. I think in a world where, you know, we are, um, acknowledged for having a strong perspective and holding to it. Um, it's been harder and harder to share and work on data and technology together that could make a difference. And I've had to kind of go back to the drawing board as Google and recognize that we are humbly just one, one seat at the table and we have to start with learning. We have to start with honoring the culture, the traditions, the emotions, the spirit that's behind this food system or set of food systems because there's not just one. They exist in different forms everywhere else. Well, okay, given that, um, we all approach it a little differently. You know, we're, there's an activist in all of us, but we express it in slightly different ways. So I'm curious how each of you now, knowing it's hard, going, go about making change. How do you do it? Top down, bottom up, through the sides? Are you, how do you ensure diversity, inclusivity, all those things as you're going about making change? Um, yeah, so for us, um, the change that we're trying to make is a narrative change. Um, it really acknowledges the fact that uh, the relationship that most folks, especially from a U.S. context, have with food um, is no relationship at all. It's a relationship that has to do with things that come out of wrappers and packages and um, have low nutritional value, have traveled half the world to be in front of them. And a lot of the emotional connection that we're speaking on is actually absent in, in most of our daily lives. And, you know, I uh, believe that story is the most powerful and pervasive uh, kind of power in our society. And that every problem that we face as humans um, really does come down to how we understand ourselves and the relationship to the world we inhabit and the communities that we are a part of. And so, you know, stories that are derivative from ancestors, elders, homes, friends, family, schools, communities, um, a lot of these stories need to be challenged, rewritten, um, reconsidered. And basically, you know, when you think about like uh, what we accept uh, or what we learn, the stories that we adopt and, and um, you know, take on are really stories that are about a dominant kind of power or derivative from a dominant source of power because we know well that the folks who are absent from those stories were not absent in those stories. And so what we're looking to do is basically uh, assert the fact that the historical narratives that we've accepted and adopted need to be challenged and we especially need to see um, a diversity and, and a reclamation in the kinds of stories that are being told because the folks who are absent in those stories, who built our country, who built our food system, 
are also the same people who are going to be at greatest risk for the climate crisis, for uh, the the crisis between health and, and diet and so forth. And so, you know, we, we really take stories seriously. And um, I think that when we look at other areas of our lives, if you're uh, trying to raise money as we've had to do, or if you're trying to um, essentially get any kind of a social or communal buy-in, you have a story to tell. We're constantly telling stories. And when it comes to food, we have completely undermined and ignored how powerful and how essential story is to the thing that we eat. And food is our most uh, shared, as you mentioned, this is the, the, the most shared part of our collective humanity. And so to uh, ignore the stories that are a part of food is to really um, miss an opportunity for a truly intersectional way of thinking and being and relating that is otherwise impossible to access because we don't have anything else in common. The food is the only thing that actually connects us. And so when we marginalize the story and the folks who contributed to that story are not in the narration of that story, then we diminish what could otherwise be a, a very radical and galvanizing power and force for good for the entire world. Yes. Oh. It, it uh, rings so deep for me because uh, you and I were chatting separately at one point and um, I had reflected at one point in the history of my family where we had no other means of creative expression except through the food. And that was a very dark time, but we told stories through food because that was the creative outlet. So, you know, Angie, you're also a storyteller and you have some strong points of view of, you know, how, well, Denise and I are not telling our story as well as we could. So I'm actually curious if you well, can help us understand. <laughs> you, you know, it's, 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 it's wonderful to, to be sitting next to, to Stephen and listening to his, his thoughtful, uh, smart, accurate responses. Uh, the, 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 those people that that for some are absent that he was referring to, in my experience traveling around the world 800 times, are actually the communities that have the solutions that we need to put in place today. It, the, 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 that dominant culture, those people in charge, uh, have have only gotten us, and, and I'm talking in the most general sense, into the trouble that we're in today. Um, the one thing that I think we we do with with big business, and I want to address this other point that you made about the biggest industry in the world being food. Um, I think big business does a really bad job of telling its own story. Um, I'm from Minneapolis, so we have companies based there like Cargill and General Mills that are, are often uh, maligned for all sorts of different practices. And yet at the same time, uh, the company in the world that, that I, well this is as of two years ago, was spending the most money on drought resistant grain research, which is vitally important if we're going to be trying to feed a very hungry planet where, with weather events moving and this insane climate crisis uh, that's only getting worse with every year and will only get worse with every year, uh, is General Mills. They're spending the most money. You, you said before to the audience, you, you, you sort of made a funny joke about why Google and, and, and food. I want Google involved in food. It's a massive company with super smart people. Um, I'm not sure six, 65 million households shop with you. I'm not sure how many, but I bet the number is really small, know that you have a foundation with a zero uh, uh, hunger, zero waste, uh, mandate, right? And that is, that's an incredible, incredible thing. And, and to, to me, because that's what makes your company so special, that there's someone leading that charge, that a company that feeds us, that has, as you said, the distribution, all the, we need big food 
to join in this fight with us. We don't want to marginalize big food. We don't want to end big food. We want to we want to change the focus of big food away from what has gotten us into trouble and towards the solutions that you're you're talking about. Um, the, the 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 what you said before about food being the the the. I forget how you expressed it, but the, it, it, there, there is nothing bigger than food in America. I, I mean, you can do a little small piece of math with me. I was a co-founder of a group called the uh, Independent Restaurant Coalition two years ago. We tried to save restaurants during COVID, or still trying, still exists, still fighting the fight. But the, the, the incredible thing is that I learned as we galvanized together, independent restaurants in America are 5% of GDP and they employ 11 million people. They're the second largest employer of human beings other than the US government. That's just independent restaurants. So if you add all the other restaurants, you add hotels and tourism, you add everyone along the food chain, it is the single largest piece of GDP in America is our food system in total with all the different 20 plugins of, of, you know, business pillars that are in there. And yet, at the same time, at the cabinet level in our federal government, we don't have a secretary of food. How is that possible? Why do we spread all these food choices amongst a gazillion agencies, three different cabinet level agencies, and not have one group that's in charge of food? Because yet again, you can't fix hunger in America without fixing our immigration problem because we need more people to pick, pack, ship, you know, and cook our food. We need to be paying them living wages and we need to make sure that they have health care. And it goes, there's a, a hierarchy of need there if we want to do this that requires someone in charge to make sure that legislation, that I, and I believe in the power of laws, is there to help all of us as opposed to just help some of us and leave others behind. Uh, and yeah, I do think big business in many cases does a bad job of telling their own stories because there are things to be celebrated there and it's why maybe some people now want to drive or walk or bike or whatever it is an extra half mile and shop at a Kroger instead of uh, one of their competitors because they have this foundation. I mean, that, that to me is a more of a selling point than whether or not the ground meat is four ninety nine or four eighty nine a pound. That's it's true. It's totally true. I was drawn in the first day I met Denise and her team. Denise, how did how did Kroger come about making change through the foundation and through this campaign work that you've done? Well, I appreciate all the fabulous comments, um, and I will tell you that that we're still working on it. We are big business, big food, uh, but we embrace that. So we agree it's part of our responsibility then to work on all of the things. So, and we have fabulous partners. Um, you named a couple. So we work with a lot of big companies also working on the same things. And they reach out to us and they say, we love zero hunger, zero waste, how can we help? And, that as, and that's on the business side. That's not even philanthropically. And so what we're trying to do is also drive change through our business operations and integrate our ESG goals and our goals for food access and food security and health and nutrition and sustainable production of food into our lines of business and our functions, whether it's our retail operations, our merchandising teams, our sourcing team, our incredible partners, the our brands team, which is what we call our line, our portfolio of private label items. So what you might know is Kroger brand or Simple Truth and private selection, it's a really big business. But our Simple Truth team and our brands culinary innovation team, they independently developed and sourced a line of plant-based foods that has been selling very well. And, and they did it, we didn't ask them to do it, it wasn't philanthropy, they did it because they saw the potential in our customers um, to meet their needs and drive sales, which is what the business has to do. So we love that there is ultimately a shared value connection here where these things are only going to happen if there is a revenue model, whether it's making, um, actually deriving value from our waste streams. I was on a panel earlier this week at the Future of Food event with some really amazing, smart, young innovators um, who have great ideas of what to do with our wastewater. And I was like, oh, 
that's amazing. We should talk more um, because we do manufacture a lot of our own food. We have 35 food processing facilities, 17 dairies. Uh, we have wastewater. Um, so we have ways to manage it today, but we can do better. But I will say on the content side, I appreciate the comments about storytelling. And I will say some of our most compelling content came through our Simple Truth team because they source a lot of things with fair trade. And we did a couple origin trips and origin stories. And we went to the, the coconut farms in the Philippines and talked to the people who work and live there and shared that story um, as far and wide as we could. But I'm sure it didn't get as many eyes as we would hope. We did the same thing with, with tea and the women who were on the tea farms in Rwanda and Egypt. So I think there are, there's a lot of compelling content and there have been great ideas this week that I would love to explore more. You know, um, when I started this journey, similarly, uh, I sought to learn and give voice to stories for people who would not normally necessarily speak up about their lived experience. And uh, I actually started working in our own kitchens for a while, uh, like get up, you know, super early, go in for the five to nine shift and then begin my day job. Um, you know, going back to this question of how do I make change, I, I, I reflected on it and I thought, you know what, it starts with respecting the user, right? Whether the user is the chef, whether the user is the farmer, whether the user is the end consumer, whether it's, you know, you or me, we all have different needs and it starts with a conversation. So I learned so much by like, a lot of our chefs are actually kind of quiet. They like cooking, but they might not be, you know, Andrew Zimmern, right, who's like incredibly amazing on stage, right, as well as a chef. Uh, but, you know, after like a couple of hours of standing with them, you know, chopping vegetables, they start to tell you things. You start to learn their life story. You start to understand, you know, why uh, they may give you a little bit more on your plate at the lunch line because that's how they grew up, um, you know, learning to show love or that's how their mother taught them to show love. Or, you know, they may have had histories where they had a bout of food insecurity and as a result, result, they make sure they use everything that they've made that day. And so getting to those stories are fundamental to um, setting the groundwork to then change, to then shift our behaviors as a collective. So I would say the final thing for me is I've learned so much to Denise's point about working with partners. Everyone has something to give. I, for a long time, I, um, I hadn't worked with academia or the public sector in the last couple of years. I've realized how, how incredibly powerful it is to listen to what perspectives they have to bring to the table because everybody has a little piece of the puzzle and it takes that kind of transcendence of, you know, we're industry or we're government or we're academia to sort of work together a little bit more loosely together, I would say. All right, final question and then we'll keep lots of room for Q&A. Um, what out of the many things you do, do you want to highlight for this audience? What is the one thing that you're super proud of that you want to share with this audience? Uh, there's so much to be highlighted. Um, I would say that, um, you know, we, in, in talking about story and narrative um, and origins, you know, the origin of the United States of America um, is really a story about agriculture. It's a story about uh, exploitation. It's a story about um, violence and theft. And I would love for people to, as I alluded to earlier, make the connection between the origins of like African American people, as in how did I end up on this continent with our food system today. And if you follow that line of thinking, which even precedes the formation of the United States of America, and you understand the ways in which, in our case and in the case of many other nations, uh, colonization has destroyed not only the, the environment, but the cultural connection to food, which is an essential part of our agency, of our sovereignty, in our identity. And the assault on all of these things, agency, sovereignty, and identity, 
has been intentional, it has been brutal, and it has been nonstop. And so what I would like for people to think about as we see negative health outcomes disproportionately in communities of color, when we see, um, we don't use the language of food deserts because they're not naturally occurring, we say food apartheid. You know, when we look at the ways in which our human intervention around people's ability to care for themselves, their families, their communities, if they even had the ability to do that on their own land that wasn't stolen from them. Now we have to connect this thinking to the problems that we face today. And so when we talk about origin as a means of reclamation, this is what we're talking about. We are, we are seeking to tell these stories, to reclaim our knowledge, to reclaim our sovereignty and our identity. And um, I hope that you all will consider that as well. Stephen, so touching. For those of you who don't already know, uh, go watch High on the Hog. Like, like, run out the door and like watch it. Like, binge watch it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Andrew, how about you? Uh, I mean, I'm a storyteller, and I try to tell the same stories uh, that Stephen does. Where, where, where I'm stuck is sort of where he left off, which is begging that question for people, how do we tell stories and in what ways can we reach different groups? Everyone hears things differently. Everyone has different sources for hearing stories, right? I mean, you were talking about don't know how many eyeballs saw the stories that you created about going to the source. I know from making television for 20 years, uh, a lot of it in which I participated as the on-screen talent, I know the stories we told. I know the groups of people we, we reached. It's about reaching those other people to tell them the, you know, the, the ideas that Stephen just talked about. I mean, what, what he just said is, is, the, is the fact of the matter. I mean, we, were, we are founded on an agriculture society built on the backs of slaves, brought over here beginning 402 years ago, right? So if, if we're, you know, we're now living in a country where there, there, there are, I mean, I'm shocked that I'm saying it, that in my lifetime, we've come from fighting to make sure that we do talk about these issues in schools to now have a situation where there are places that are, are have created laws that we're not allowed to talk about these things in schools, and yet those stories are, it, it is our salvation. It is our only way out if we're going to solve our, primarily, uh, our societal problems, of which I think the biggest one right now is food and climate and how we relate to one another. Um, the stuff that I'm uh, proudest of are the, the projects that we make w at our production company from What's Eating America, which was a series we did for MSNBC a couple of years ago that explored food through uh, six pillars, immigration, addiction, climate change, healthcare, things like that. Um, and the work that we continue to do, we're doing a, a natural history documentary uh, on uh, the oceans and how we save our seas uh, by interacting with them, not by leaving them alone, not by pillaging them, but by going around the world and seeing the solutions, some of which are thousands of years old, employed in places far away by people who Stephen was talking about as being uh, considered absent, right, by many of the dominant groups, who actually have this, the solutions are out there. The solutions are out there. We, we, we just look at healthy people around the world and science tells us eat less meat, eat more grains, vegetables, and farinaceous foods, eat, you know, uh, skip a couple meals a week, you know, I mean, on and on and on, gather foods from the wild, you know, share. I mean, these are just sort of basic human instinctual things that when you look at people who have solved these problems, who live in societies that don't have some of the issues that we do, they have other ones, um, we, we, we can learn. And, and that is, that at its essence, what great storytelling uh, does. Now, if you want to hook more eyeballs, you tell people you're going to learn something, some people just turn the channel. If you make something that is, it's true, it, I mean, 
buyers out there would like people to shake their heads and go, wow, I didn't know that, while at the same time being entertained. And so to be able to do that in a way that is, that is positive, solution-oriented, entertaining, and educational, uh, you know, that's the stuff that I work on every day, whether it's through things I write, television that I produce, documentaries we make, whatever, whatever that may be. Um, and, and I think we all need to really be focusing on telling stories. I, I'm, I'm constantly finding myself saying the same thing everywhere I go, which is, it's not as much about opening your wallets and donating money to cause A, B, or C. If everyone who's here today and hearing this wherever, whether it's you know at home on your computer, live in the audience, took something that you learned today and just put it in an email to everyone on your list and just help create more awareness, we have so many people in this country that have blinders on that are just not aware to any of the issue of any of the issues that we're talking. They understand the problems because they see them at the gas pump, they see them at, at the supermarket in terms of uh, rising costs or an empty shelf at different points over the last two years. They see it, but they don't understand its its root cause. And I think we have to increase that understanding and education and do it in a, in a way that actually engages people and that to me is is the biggest focus of my work so beautiful so beautiful for me uh, I'm I'm not a storyteller I'm sitting you know with giants here and I realize that you know the one small role we can play is to ensure that the stories get out to the people who really need to hear them the ones that not may not normally have access to them and so you know as you were speaking you know it made me think about you know in some of these uh, really really rural places in the world like in Nigeria I've I've known of stories of you know uh, you know, young young boys will climb up to the top of a tree so they, they could get an internet connection, so they could watch the YouTube video mm -hmm. to learn how to do electrical engineering. And I, I would want to see the same thing as the stories are being created for those who need access to them to get the access to them. Well, it's it's, it's fascinating that you talk about that. I mean, you know, the 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 the, the fact that that high on the hog was was made is something that is a huge win for everyone that those stories got out there is a huge win for everyone so now how do we make sure that there's more of that going on right it's you know i'm going to zambia uh, in april and i'm going to shoot something over there with the united nations world food program and you know i i worry every night i mean it keeps me up at night i haven't even gotten there about making sure that everyone hears the stories that we're telling there about the solution makers in that country who have some incredible agricultural uh wisdom that we could all benefit from i live in minneapolis uh where the Hmong, who are a, a, a tribal people from the hill country where Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam intersect. They don't even have their own country. Um, the, during the war between uh, North Vietnam and the United States, uh, they were almost eliminated, but they were airlifted out. The majority of them live in Minneapolis, uh, Twin Cities, where the largest uh, population of Hmong are. And they have literally taught an agriculture state, I live in Minnesota, that's an ag state, literally taught us vertical farming, that you get, you can grow more food if you do it go, rising than if you do it in a linear way on the ground. Um, and, you know, th those stories, you know, those, those little moments are what drive me forward um, and just trying to figure out how to get more people to see uh, what I see, you know, take off those smudgy glasses and put on a new, a new set of lenses and look at the world and seek the solutions. Oh, that's amazing. So, Denise, I mean, Kroger's in 2,800 communities across the country. I mean, you, you have people coming to your stores every week, and through that experience, they are picking up stories. Um, where are you at with that? What are you most proud of at this point, given that you've had a five-year journey? Right. So, I, I do want to say, too, and appreciate what, what everyone else has said, you know, we also, with our food selection and assortment, we try to offer a wide range of options to serve a lot of different groups of people. Um, we typically will provide or offer in our stores what the neighbors around that store want to buy. 
Um, is it always perfect? No. But what we have heard through the pandemic too is a lot more people cooked meals at home, which we love. Um, many are now returning to restaurants now that they're opening, which is also wonderful for our communities. Um, but they are also telling us they are now, after cooking for a long time at home, they are more aware of their own household food waste. They are more aware of food packaging and issues associated with it. And they are asking more questions about what they can do personally, which I think is really encouraging and hopeful. So I'm excited by that because I think we have an opportunity now to tell more of these stories. And people are more interested in where their food is made and who is making it and where it comes from. So I think that is all really encouraging for us to think about and it gives us the opportunity to tell more stories, which is great. I also would say that when it, we are hopeful about the intersection with technology because a lot more of our customers are comfortable with technology now. They are accustomed to, or they're familiar with at least, um, maybe ordering groceries online and picking them up or having them delivered. And we hope our vision, which is you know, with zero hunger, zero waste as well, but also with that business opportunity, our hope is that Kroger Delivery and we just announced very recently that we're opening fulfillment centers in Austin and San Antonio to serve uh, people here who don't have Kroger stores. Um, you'll be able to have your groceries delivered. You'll be able to enjoy our brand products. And we think delivery will help us unlock food access where there are not grocery stores today, where we have not perhaps been able to operate them profitably, but we are hopeful that delivery will truly bring more food access. So that's the dream. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, I'll take the final stab and we'll go into Q&A. So um, for me, you know, the one thing I, I do wanna share with this audience is, um, this work takes a lot of courage, and I, I'm really proud, you know, having Kroger and Denise and team inspire us at Google. We finally actually did really hard work to set really big, audacious goals for our global system around food. So we're going to go and cut our food waste by 50% by 2025. It's hard. We already cut 10 million pounds of food out in the last, like, you know, seven years, that's like taking 5,000 cars off the road for an entire year's worth of food. And we still got to do more. And then in addition, diverting it all away from landfill, I mean, that should help the environment in a really, really big way. So it takes corporations, really big ones, a lot of like behind the scenes work to get everybody aligned, get everybody confident to say something like that. And so it might not seem like much that a large company made a goal. It's actually super duper meaningful because it also helps our suppliers upstream work with us with these goals. And it also helps all the waste management companies and food recovery companies downstream also work with us on these goals. We have to you know, put it out there, just like if I'm gonna run a marathon, if I tell all you I'm gonna run a marathon, I'm probably gonna run the marathon with much greater likelihood than if I kept it to myself. So there's something about that that, um, that is really, really important. I think bigger picture as well with technology, since you know, you're, a lot of you are asking, what is the intersection of technology, food, and culture? Um, we have a role and we have to show up user facing first. I mentioned that a little earlier. But, you know, I'm super excited about some of the work that Denise and I are doing around making that surplus food more visible. I think there are at least 100,000 food banks and pantries out there. If we can make every food bank and pantry, whether it's a church, you know, group, whether it's, you know, a um, school, whether it's part of a bigger network, whether it's standalone, have visibility into what's available. I think a lot of that excess surplus that we have in the country, which is like 10 billion pounds probably per year, uh, have a better chance of being recovered. So technology for me is about bringing more visibility. Just like the internet made it possible for anyone to self-publish, if we could give the same kind of transparency and visibility to that excess food so that more people can take action to recover it, I think more of that food will go to people who need it versus to landfill, which is where a lot of it currently goes. And I, and I would thank Emily and her team. They, they have been so gracious and generous with their time um, to help us figure this out. So they have really shaped um, our vision over time 
into creating not just a better and more inclusive food system, but a better and more inclusive charitable food system so that we are truly directing any surplus food to its highest purpose, which is feeding people. Um, so thank you to your team. And, for and, and to do it empathically, you know, there's so much shame involved in, yes. in hunger and homelessness and unemployment and all the other things that, uh, you know, human beings live through. The human experience um, is filled with lots of trauma and carried shame. And that is a barrier for a lot of people uh, to, to seek help. You know, if, if, you know, those mobile trucks you know, going around and bringing food to people uh, is a is a tremendous solution. But anyway, here, questions. here, here, here. Let's do some questions. Okay. Um, well, you know what? Let's actually dive in further since we're already on this topic. Let me read it out. Uh, those in hunger need actions, not stories. Stories are far away and take too long. How to impact the system faster and actual actually feed those in need. Is upvoted. That's what I want to. Do I can I can respond to that. Um, you know I, I I hear that because there's urgency um, because people are are hungry and starving. Um, but what I would uh, suggest is that um, what's lacking is actually an effective story, or conversely, um, what is the story that needs to be told to create the urgency in community to solve for these problems. And as, as Andrew was just alluding to, uh, the, the, the shame that comes with the stories that our society and our communities have placed upon us for not being able to feed ourselves, right? So like, I understand that it feels like it's not part of an urgent correction, but creating a story that drives an urgent correction is the point. So, so that's really, you know, what I'm advocating for and, and agitating around story in particular. And, and who you tell it to. I mean, I, I really, really believe there are stories that I want all of you to know, and then there are stories I want to tell to the, you know, select committee on appropriations in the Senate, right? I mean, be, because the, the, the you know, the, this, this farm bill that should be called the food bill has, you know, $900 million or whatever, the, some ridiculous amount of money in, in SNAP, right? Which is a government program that actually puts more money into our economy than it takes out. And we should be doing more with SNAP and, and providing more dollars uh, for those that need it to buy fresh, healthy foods. And we need to have an educational component to tell them what there is that they can do with it quickly and efficiently because people are not just dollar poor, they're time poor. I mean, these are, we, pre, when, when COVID happened, 20% of the people above the poverty line automatically dropped below it. And I would argue that that picture that came out in late March in the New York Times, uh, above the fold, of overhead shot of the San Antonio Food Bank, a place that I've been and told stories from, that actually showed that line of cars that had increased. And they made the point of like, look at the brands of the cars. Look at who's online, look at who's hungry, right? Um, these are our neighbors. These are our, our family members, our coworkers. No one's raising their hand and saying, I'm hungry. It's really, really, really difficult situation. So we have to do everything that we can to tell stories in the right place to the right people. I understand the frustration, but this is why I said at the very beginning, we have to act on many different levels. People like Stephen and I tell stories and motivate people and try to move the needle where where we can. You know, De Denise's company is trying to eliminate food waste. Well, when a when a supermarket uh, does that, that means not throwing away the food that is absolutely 100% edible, but doesn't necessarily look great on display, and having a place for that to go other than a a dumpster, right? And I know that Kroger is engaged in that because you can't eliminate, you, you can't have a zero waste program without thinking about what you do with all those, you know, tomatoes at the bottom of the basket. And, and so that is, there are so many levers that need to be pushed at the same time. We all need to push the levers that we're most expert at. No one can push them all. 
Well, I was just going to say we, we should be encouraged um, that in the last couple of years, <clears throat> we've seen several, many, tens, dozens, hundreds of really innovative solutions be born out of the urgency of the pandemic. So that's among our food bank partners and other hunger relief organizations and people who just started to scale up a really great idea and it became really big. Um, one of those is the group of Stanford students who stood up FarmLink, which was amazing. Um, it also includes some of the uh, amazing entrepreneurs and social enterprises that we've supported through our Zero Hunger, Zero Waste Foundation's Innovation Fund. Some of them we were able to direct additional funding to to help them scale quickly and get food boxes to people who needed it in the middle of, of such dire conditions. So I, I am also hopeful because we see so many great ideas out there, but we need more. So I think innovation will help. Um, some solutions that, are, that have been piloted or might be in beta need to be scaled and can be scaled quickly. So we believe we need everyone, we need all of it. Um, and, and that's the point of an inclusive charitable food system is we've got some amazing partners with Feeding America and we have some amazing partners outside of their circle who are just doing tremendous things feeding people in your local community. So we would say we need everyone and we appreciate and welcome them all. <laughs> I feel really fortunate that the pandemic actually gave us an opening. I feel like three years ago when we were talking about these topics, nobody really wanted to talk about them really in earnest, right? But when it made that front page news, New York Times, this, you know, farmers plowing their crops back in the ground, right. and the lineup in San Antonio Food Bank, actually every food bank in the country was three times as long, and it was normal everyday people, our colleagues, right? I feel like there was a resurgence in awareness, and everybody is aware now, and I made a commitment to surf that way for as long as I could. Like, the time is now, and I'm so glad all of you are here thinking about these topics. That was the urgency that we earned from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't think people understood that we plowed under crops. I mean, I just don't because there was no one to to pick the lettuce because the because the immigration uh, <laughs> The, the visa types that allowed for temporary workers to come into the uh, into the country had been cut in half. There aren't enough people to pick crabs in Maryland, to pick lettuce in California. It is an urgent problem. Immigration reform is is urgently needed uh, in America right now, so that we can that everything that we grow comes out of the ground and then gets distributed. Anyway, sorry. Here, 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 here. Well, also, I learned that 75% of our winter produce comes from one port, right? Mm -hmm. In the port of Nogales. Our food system is complex. We grow a lot of food here, but there's a lot of other people in the rest of the world who are also growing food that we eat and honoring what they do and understanding their lives and using mm -hmm. technology, data, storytelling, all the levers that we can pull to help them as well. Because our food system is not just internal, right? Right. We're the largest exporter of food in the world. The United States. I mean, just think about that, and we still can't feed our own people. It's it's uh, it is a very complex issue. Well, that concludes the formal portion. We'll stick around. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, that was fun.